Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for being patient. We do like to start on time, but, but uh, the city manager has, is not yet here. Apparently, he's doing city manager stuff, and uh, he will be here. So we're very happy to see you all here. We, the Richmond Historic Preservation Commission, love this event. It's very exciting, and it's fun. And So why don't I start with asking all the commissioners to stand up? Thank you very much. And we're going to start with our chair, Rosemary Corbin. It's where it is. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and helping us honor the people who are help pre helping to preserve our history. It's, historic preservation is really very important for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's important for us to remember our heritage. It's important to teach our children why they should be proud of their hometown. It's important for new residents to learn the history and legacy of our city. And it's good for economic development. So uh, there are two parts to it. Our, our commission helps to identify places that should be put on our list of historic places. But this part of the process is where we honor people who have preserved our history in one way or another. It's not only buildings. It's not only places. Sometimes it's books. Sometimes it's a performance. Sometimes it's um, something else. But uh, ways that, that people have helped us preserve the legacy of Richmond. And it really is a long, rich legacy. So we've been doing a lot of catch up because we only started this a few years back. Uh, but anyway, thank you all for coming and helping us um, go through this process for the city and for all of our residents and all our future residents. So thank you again. Mayor Gail McLaughlin is here to say a few words and to present a proclamation because May is Historical Preservation Month. Mayor? Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, everyone, for being here to celebrate in this wonderful award ceremony. This is always a real pleasure to be here and celebrate people that have worked so hard to preserve history in the city of Richmond. And um, I would like to read just a few of the whereases of this proclamation and present it to Rosemary Corbin as the chair of the Historic uh, Preservation Commission. Um, and then I'll have a few extra words to say, and then I think next we'll, we'll have some more speakers, I know, as well, and then the award winners. So, whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for preserving nat natural resources, managing growth and sustainable development, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride, and maintaining community character while enhancing livability. And whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life, and all ethnic backgrounds. And whereas the city of Richmond has an active historic preservation program with a number of locally, statewide, and nationally designated historic resources and districts. And whereas the city of Richmond Historic Preservation Commission and Nas uh, National Park Service is hosting the 2014 Historic Preservation Awards Ceremony on May 12th today at Richmond City Council Chambers in observation of National Historic Preservation Month and to increase public awareness of Richmond's heritage by recognizing individuals, organizations, businesses, and agencies whose contributions demonstrate outstanding commitment to historic preservation, local history, and the promotion of the city's heritage. And this year's theme of National Historic Preservation is 
embark, inspire, and engage. And that is certainly what we do here in the city of Richmond. So I would like to just name a few of the co-sponsors. Like I said, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Richmond Museum of History, the National Park Service, Point Richmond History Association, Rosie the Riveter Trust, Richmond Main Street, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and all these wonderful organizations and so many more that uh, utilize this opportunity to come together and celebrate Richmond's history are all people who work hard to encourage um, all, you know, everyone in our community to learn about the many historic sites, buildings, landscapes, individuals, and artifacts that are part of our history. So now therefore, I, Mayor Gail McLaughlin, on behalf of the Richmond City Council, do hereby proclaim May 2014 as National Preservation Month and call upon the people of Richmond to join their fellow citizens across the entire United States in recognizing and participating in this special obs observance. And it's my pleasure to present this to Rosemary Corbin. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. So thank you to Rosemary, to the entire commission, um, to everyone, all, all those who uh, come together to celebrate this wonderful, wonderful month. And um, I want to state that this is a very special, special type of celebration when we celebrate history, when we celebrate historic preservation, because in doing so, we also celebrate the future by holding on to our history, we celebrate the future. And I, I just want to end with one simple quote. I think I may have actually used this quote before at uh, this yearly event, but it's one that, that means a real lot to me. I think, uh, I think you'll see it has a, a, a real special um, statement. So it's by William Murtagh, the first keeper of the National Register of Historic Places. And he says, it has been said that at its best, preservation engages the past in a conversation with the present over a mutual concern for the future. And that's what this is all about. And thank you all for being a part of this celebration. And with that, I'll hand the microphone back to Sandy. She's here. <laughs> there she is. And it seems that our city manager is here, and he always has a few words to say about historic preservation. Bill? Oh, <laughs> I was looking there, and here he is. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. I, I, um, I think I, I uh, you know, history is, is um, different things to different people, of course, and and I think I missed last year's event, and, uh, and I found out what history means to Sandy, because she said if I missed this year, I'd be history. <laughs> and I should never let it happen again. So, so here I am, and it is, I'm really very, very proud to be here. You know, it, um, I was once, uh, uh, back in my finance director days with another city, I went back uh, for a bond rating presentation, and we were talking about historic preservation. And uh, this, this uh, analyst uh, from New York and Moody's and Stodgy said, what could possibly be historic in California? <laughs> and, uh, and I'll never forget him saying that, you know, that, that um, uh, and, I'll, and I, it really brought home to me the importance of really preserving history. And, um, and I, I think some of you have, have heard this. This is, I, I guess, telling a story again is history repeating itself. I'll tell, my, tell it again. It's, um, when I first came to Richmond, one of the, or was considering coming to Richmond, I um, had a wonderful tour of the, the fledgling Rosie the Riveter National Historic Park and the, the Rosie um, sculpture, the monument there, and, and uh, re read the history and the social change. And probably that more than anything else said, I want to come here and I want to do something uh, important for the community if I can. Uh, it was that it was that sense of history. It was that sense of place that that um, made Richmond such an important place in in my mind and and really 
in my heart. And then learning uh, about the many institutions that have endured over time through a lot of different struggles. Uh, the Richmond Art Center, just uh, celebrating its 75th anniversary and, and doing so well. Uh, I was so proud to be involved um, to uh, uh, my limited extent with the renovation of the plunge. Um, and uh, what a, a great project that was. And uh, East Bay Center for the Performing Arts as well, preserving history. One of the things that one doesn't always think about, though, is, is uh, history does mean a lot to, to everybody and that preservation. I was at a, a presentation. This was uh, a group of, of those that were interested in advanced manufacturing. And they had come to Richmond for a conference. And they, were, they gathered at the Craneway. And uh, so I did the welcoming there. And it was a pleasure just to talk about the building, just to talk about the Craneway, talk about uh, where they were sitting uh, in, as, a, as a place and, and convey that sense of, of history uh, as a manufacturing venue. And that really did grab them. And, and you can, it's, it's amazing how that, that can pull people in. The, um, those being honored this evening, uh, these are just such uh, terrific projects um, moving the community forward as we, as we um, uh, continue to respect the past. The Riggers Loft at the port, the, the, um, uh, the new point, the, the new map at the point, Richmond, um, great wayfinding, the, um, again, the arts, the blossoms and thorns, the East Bay Center for the Performing Arts, and of course, the laying down new tracks, if you'll pardon the expression, for the, the trails on the, on the shoreline, um, which will certainly become something that, that Richmond has talked about for, for many years to come. Uh, and how that, that trail was developed. So with really a great deal of admiration, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and provide a little bit of a, a welcome and, and just my opportunity to say thank you for, for all that you've done for the community and thanks for preserving its history. Tom Budd is maybe the father of our commission. He really uh, pushed to have it organized, and he is the city council liaison for historic preservation. So, Tom? So this, this is one of my favorite events of the year, and uh, uh, technically I am the liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I'm so glad the mayor put me on that instead of, like, maybe the liaison to the housing authority. <laughs> because, because you all make me look so good. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't say a lot more than what's already been said, except that in the, in the actually it's been 19 years since I've been on the city council, w one of the changes in Richmond that... Um, that I think is is really heightened is is Richmond's embracing of historic preservation in all of its um, you know both the, the the buildings the places the people the books and and all those types of things uh, when I first came on the city council in the mid 90s uh, there was no historic preservation program both the staff and the city council were suspicious and antagonistic towards such a thing ever happening. Right, Rosemary? Where'd she go? Okay. okay. And, so, um, and so we started one up, and look what we've done. And we're not done yet, and uh, let the party begin. Okay, so now we have some awards to give. So, the Riggers Loft is the latest building in Richmond to be renovated. And as somebody who spends a lot of time on the Red Oak Victory, uh, I and all the other people on the Red Oak are really happy that the Riggers Loft has been renovated. And Robin Cowelty is going to present the award. Robin. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I will be presenting the award for the Riggers Loft. And I'd like to 
sort of give you an idea about the Riggers Loft and what makes it important to us here in Richmond. The Riggers Loft was originally constructed in 1942 as part of the Richmond Shipyard Number no. 3. It provided the support for the prefabrication and assembly of ships during World War II. And as you know, Richmond was in full swing during World War II, breaking records, putting out those ships. And over the years, not surprisingly, it fell into disrepair and deterioration. Trusses collapsed, roofs collapsed, siding deteriorated. In 2008, the very wise Port of Richmond was awarded a California Office of Homeland Security Port, Harbor, and Ferry Terminal Security Grant in the amount of $4.3 million for building improvements at the Port of Richmond Operations and Security Center. The Richmond City Council voted to relocate the Port of Richmond Operations and Security Center to the Riggers Loft, a win-win situation that would provide for historic rehabilitation and upgrade of the Riggers Loft. The firm of WJE prepared a historic structure report, and based on that report, they created a full scheme that addressed and improved the, the se severe deterioration. In addition, they were able to upgrade it according to code the paint shop so that it could be used as the Port of Richmond Operations and Security Center. They also managed to do all of this while retaining the original look of the open framing of the interior. They even were able to use the, the to entirely hide the interior framing and uh, they were able to rehabilitate 75% of the original siding and over 90% of the original windows. We love original windows around here. They even reproduced the original sign based on four letters found at the site and based on original drawings from the archives. Accordingly, the Historic Preservation would like to award both WJE, Alan Dreyfus, the Port of, of Richmond, which would, is represented by Michael Williams, and Bob Alton, who was the contractor with a preservation award for their excellent work. Well, we have a lot of things to cover tonight. So on behalf of the port, um, I'd like to start off by saying, number one, uh, it's my oversight that Bob Alton doesn't have one of these, so I'm going to beg the uh, committee to please, 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 um, I should have made it a point to include his name as part of the uh, award recipients because he's, he's not just the contractor, he's our contractor. And uh, some of the work that was done, that's the only reason I was uh, up here, was just to say that the, what made this successful was just having a project team and lots of times people would get assembled as teams and people are thrown together and we kind of all were. We, we had never worked together before at all, came from different, got to the project in different ways, but um, uh, you couldn't ask for a better team and that's, that's the one key thing. Um, the best architect that could have come and done the work was WJE represented by Alan Dreyfus. I mean, Alan's been just, the, he's the best architect to work with he gave everything above and beyond to the project, and it is what it is today because of his uh, help, his ability, his insight, and the same thing goes for Bob. Bob has been the best contractor for this project. There's lots of contractors in town. Bob's a local Richmond contractor as well, but um, just the, the diligence and work that he brought, we had some change orders because some were just gonna be part of the process, but he went way above and beyond the call of duty um, responded to every single call, everything we needed an answer for, Bob uh, got it worked out um, in the field. And so uh, that's part of the reason why we have this project. And then also I'd like to thank the city council for having the foresight to vote for it, to support it, to uh, provide some city funds when they were needed to, you know, that uh, when we went above and beyond the grant, 
um, just because uh, of the type of work we were doing, the type of preservation, it just was going to require a little more than the grant, uh, as great as the grant was. And um, it's also hard to give um, uh, Council Member Tom Butt any more awards than he has. I don't know if anyone has any more awards than he has, but this is another case in point for you to know that it was Council Member Tom Butt that went to the state and got the grant reallocated so it went to this project. If he had not done that, we don't have this project because the city did not have $4.3 million. No one did, and but it was only his perseverance and going to the state and working after it. So that made it happen. City Council supported him, and we did the best we could in the field um, to make it happen. And I think now the city has a project that they can be uh, proud of. It's going to stand for another 70 years or so, we hope. And uh, I don't want to say too much, you know, too far in advance, but um, the port intends the building is about 26 or 27,000 square feet. The port is going to occupy 5,000 square feet of it. But the port is also at this time, the port director is not here tonight because he's in negotiations now uh, with some investors. But um, there's a pending lease that we're looking at that will occupy the rest of the building uh, that will be taken to city council in the next 30 to 60 days or so, we hope. And uh, that will seal the deal completely for the project being done and the building being fully occupied. So, um, you know, I just want to give thanks to our team and to Council Member Butt and the City Council and City Manager, everyone for supporting the project. City staff, fire department worked on it, worked on plans. Everyone participated. None of this was done in a vacuum. It's a team effort. And so um, that's why we have the project we have. Thank you. I guess I don't have to thank everybody then, right? You, you thank most everybody. Um, you know, I wanted to, you know, Eric uh, Onik is here. He was the project manager on the project. I wanted to uh, point, point him out. Um, we had a couple superintendents on the project, and it, and it was, I, I, I just want to echo what you said about the, the team. And Alan was great to work with. Um, we went out there, give me an example of the windows. You know, Alan wanted to replay, or, you know, fin refinish the windows. We were going in there, we were picking out the, uh, the rust out there. I said, this is not going to work, Alan, look at these things. <laughs> so we came up with an idea to, you know, sandblast them, and, and uh, we, we saved, I thought we saved more than 90%, but it was, um, so the ideas that we came up with, like, it saved a bunch of money, it's, it, it, and they were all reused, so it was, it really goes out, you know, my hat goes off to the team that uh, did the project. It was really a lot of fun, and we're happy to be a part of it. Thank you. I'm going to just have to echo what's been said. Um, it was an exceptional uh, team. Uh, Port of Oakland, uh, Michael Williams, great client to work with. Uh, Bob Alton, excellent contractor who really threw his weight behind the project. Uh, I, he doesn't remember probably the, the first time I met him, sat down, and I, I, ch I challenged him. I said, this is a project that's ex extraordinarily difficult, and the budget's too low. You really want to do this? <laughs> And he said yes, and, and damned if we didn't do it. Um, as a preservation architect, uh, the, the best thing about my job is the opportunity to discover new stories. And the Riggers Loft, uh, in, in doing the history of that for the historic structure report and digging into it and, and coming up with the rehabilitation effort, introduced me to shipyard number three, which I was not familiar with. Uh, it is an incredible resource, and, and you all should be very proud of, of the fact that you've got um, a resource as, you know, as, as extraordinarily valuable as this one in the city of Richmond. Um, anyway, I want to congratulate all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Glasses. So this is a, 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 a recent project. Well, they all are. Um, but we're uh, very excited about the map at uh, Point Richmond. And Pat is going to give the award. Pat Pearson. Sorry about that. Everybody knows Pat, but still, Pat Pearson, um, for the Women's Westside Improvement Club.
great to see so many of you here. And we're very proud of our Women's West Side Improvement Club. The club was established in 1908 by a group of women in Point Richmond for the betterment of the town. And believe me, it certainly must have needed betterment in 1908. 1908 was also the year of incorporation for the city of Richmond, uh, not to be confused with 1905 chartered city designation at the, at the beginning of the town. The first project for the club were a small playground named Janice Park, still on Washington and Dickland Avenue, a town reading room that evolved into the west side branch of the Richmond Library, uh, the Indian statue drinking fountain for horses, dogs, and people in 1909. And in 1913, uh, they uh, helped out Washington School. And then there was a new Washington School in 1941, and they were right there to help it. My mother was PTA president. <laughs> and the in and the, uh, then they had another newer Washington School, which was remodeled by uh, Andrew Butt's direction in 204. So we were there for all of those and continue to help uh, the Many Hands program and Washington School and many other places within the city of Richmond and also Meals on Wheels. We do get out of our boundaries sometimes. Over the years, the membership continued to raise money and vote to contribute funds and volunteer time to various community activities. Those included the flagpole at the Plunge in 1926, still there. Many projects during World War II when there were soldiers stationed at Washington School, the old Washington School. And a street map of Point Richmond at the corner of Park Place and West Richmond in the 1980s. It, people wonder why would you need a street map when you all have a GPS or something. <laughs> Believe me, they do not work in Point Richmond. <laughs> Point Richmond streets were laid out by somebody, must be over this side of town, on a grid. So we've got streets that aren't there, and then in some places, streets that are there that aren't on the map. So you really need this map. The map was put at the corner of Park Place in West Richmond in the 1980s. They also supported the moving of the Point Richmond History Building to its current site in the Triangle at Point Richmond in 1990. We don't go into that one too deeply, but our building is situated in the Triangle. <laughs> and open, we do have uh, Thursdays and Saturdays if you'd like to come by at the Point Richmond History Association. In, in 2008, Alpha Humphrey, a member of the Women's Wife's Side Improvement Club, was looking at the old street map next to the fire station. When she came to the next to Women's Improvement Club meeting, she said the map was looking bad and it was time to replace it. You actually couldn't see the street. She said that since the Women's Improvement Club had put the old map up more than 20 years ago, we should put up a new map for a centennial project. So in 1908, the group, or 2008, the group approved the plan and President Marskowski took on the responsibility for the new map. We now want to present our new president, or existing, no, she's not new, a couple of years, Norma Wallace, and Alpha Humphrey, who discovered that maybe something should be done about this. They will come up, please. Thank you, it is a wonderful crowd. And yes, Margaret Murkowski, who was the project manager on this entire project, was unavailable to be here tonight. She and Alpha were going to be up here with me to accept the award, and Alpha, who is a retired AutoCAD drafter, by the way, was the one who, uh, rather oddly, did notice that the map was looking rather old and brought it to the club's attention. So we will start there. 
So on behalf of the Women's West Side Improvement Club, I am here to represent the club and humbly accept this award with a huge nod to Tom Butt, without whose work and passion, our village of Point Richmond would likely not exist as we know it today. He has excited us all about historic preservation to all of our benefit. You have just heard from Pat Pearson, a long-standing member of the West, Women's West Side Improvement Club, about our history and strong ties to the city of Richmond. Now I have the honor and privilege of taking you through the history of the map. And I do have a lot of notes, and I have been encouraged to share details with you. So before we go through the details, it does take a village and I want to be sure to acknowledge all of the individuals and organizations that made this project, we have beautiful pictures, of, is that Irene, your work, it, um, that their uh, team effort made possible. So, Connie Lampa, Lisa Graves, Altha Humphrey, Margaret Morkowski, Richmond Rotary, Laura Kuhn, New York City and Deer Park, New York, Berkeley, California, Point Richmond Gateway Foundation, Josh Genzer, Jeff Lee, Martin McNair, Ranger Elizabeth Tucker, the Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park, Bruce Byert, Trails for Richmond Action Committee, Fossil Industries, Gordon Hirano, Shigoto Ya, including Johnny and Pete, Frank Gonzalez, the Richmond Parks Department, Linda Newton, David Moore, Sincere Design, Marion Kent, Stephen Lee Holloway, Tom Butt, and the Richmond Fire Department. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll all wait till the end to find out how all those people participated. So by 2008, the ladies of the Women's West Side Improvement Club were very excited about celebrating the club's centennial. Ideas for the projects and the event celebrations abounded. The president at the time, Connie Lampa, led the Landscape Committee in obtaining a landscaping grant from the Point Richmond Gateway Foundation. Con Connie worked closely with Lisa Graves of the city's Parks Department to renovate and expand the Rose Garden area adjacent to the current Indian Statue Fountain couple of old projects there. Retired professional AutoCAD drafter and community volunteer Altha Humphrey, who is also the founder of the Arts of Point Richmond and Knit and Such, and I, is this a career thing? And this is her own design, uh, pondered the old map one day and when she came to the meeting expressed her concern. Margaret Morkowski, the president at the time, took on the project management responsibilities. It took three years to locate a dedicated professional through Richmond Rotary, as it turned out, Laura Kuhn, a graphics designer and illustrator who, in New York's, who was from New York City, now in Berkeley, and she basically adopted this as a pet project of hers. Through a lengthy process of interviews, reviewing photos of the old map, and brainstorming ideas, the final list of desires for highlighting some of the historical aspects of the point and ensuring all of the new streets in the Brickyard Cove area were included. A key design feature of Laura's, and you'll see on the picture, is the enlarged insert of the downtown area. The Women's Club was able to provide Laura with a stipend from the centennial fundraising activities. As the project evolved, we voted her additional funds. It was apparent Laura contributed significantly on a pro bono basis to this project. Margaret Morkowski spearheaded researching how to make the map weather resistant and graffiti and vandal proof. Ranger Elizabeth Tucker of the Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park and Bruce Byert of Track offered recommendations and vendors. After a field trip, Fossil Industries of Deer Park, New York was selected to fabricate the design. The technical exchanges and fabrication of the Mac took about three months. The final product for the engineers, okay, is a 1 8 inch metal panel size 48 inches by 58 and a half inches. Part of the plan included a local uh, negotiation with Gordon Hirano, owner of Shigoti Yaw, 40 years plus in Point Richmond. 
to design and install a replacement fence and the structure to hold the map. Gordon agreed if the women's club paid for the materials, Shigoda Yaw would sponsor the design of the structure and handle the installation of the map as their contribution to the community. At this point, the Women's West Side Improvement Club applied for and received a new grant from the Richmond, Point Richmond Gateway Foundation for the materials to be used for the map frame and structure. After Laura finished her work with the map fabricator, the map was delivered to Shigoto Yaw on Tewksbury. Gordon and his staff began working on the final design and construction activities. During this time, the staff was very gracious as one after the other of us trooped down to take a peek at the map. <laughs> Moving towards project completion, Margaret talked with Frank Gonzalez of the Parks Department about the removal of the old map, pouring cement for the post holes, and the new landscaping. Frank, Gordon, and Margaret met at the site and discussed final requirements. Gordon and Frank offered some great ideas for finishing touches and plantings in the area. The Women's West Side Improvement Club has funds for the landscaping, and Frank will be working with our member Linda Newton of the Women's West Side Improvement Club Landscape Committee on selecting the new plantings, and she is somewhat of an authority given that her, she has done years of volunteer work with the California Native Plant Society and that is the direction the plantings will be going. Uh, with the posts in place, Gordon, Johnny, and Pete of Shigoda Yaw finished the map frame and structure. The unveiling is announced for 10.30 a.m. Saturday, April 5, on the pointrichmond.com website, hosted by David Moore of Sincere Design. Alpha headed the map unveiling celebration committee. She, uh, she booked the community center for refreshments. Club members brought homemade desserts to go along with the fresh fruit, peach, and strawberry drinks, and hot coffee. About 100 people gathered at 10.30 promptly for the map unveiling. As president of the club, I performed as master of ceremonies. Alpha found and rang a handheld school bell as I attempted to acknowledge all those who had been involved in the celebration and in the project, including Alpha as celebration committee chair, Marion Kent as her co-chair, City staff member Frank Gonzalez and his staff, and our event photographer Steve Holloway. I then surprised Margaret with a certificate of acknowledgement for her project management efforts. Last but not least, our local council member Tom Butt and the designer Gordon Hirano Shigoda Ya removed the plywood covering and officially unveiled the map. The crowd cheered, the fire department set their horns blaring, and the photographers snapped their photographs. <laughs> With a final, final thank you for coming, the, cloud, the crowd moved up to the map to take a closer look. The Women's West Side Improvement Club hopes to inspire and engage you to take a closer look at the, uh, the next time you visit Richmond's West Side. And we invite the women of the group of the room to join us at our next meeting, which is Tuesday, June 3rd, Hat Day. Thank you very much. And for all her efforts, Our Lady. Very nice. Okay. For those of us who spent a lot of time at the um, Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park Visitor Center, we're really excited about this next award. And every year when we give the Historic Preservation Awards, the National Park gives a Homefront Award. And this year, uh, and this is why we're so excited about it, it's a movie that we show often in the Visitor Center and it's a very uh, profound movie and uh, heart-wrenching. 
and Tom Leatherman, who is the superintendent of the park, will present the award. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, every year, I uh, have the honor to present the Homefront Award, and it's given to individuals and organizations whose efforts greatly advance the understanding and appreciation of the values that led to the establishment of Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park. And I'll try not to say the name too much too many more times tonight. <laughs> this year, it is my pleasure to present the award to the film Blossoms and Thorns, A Community Uprooted. For those who have seen the movie or are familiar with the history, you know that this film documents the experiences of Japanese American flower growing families in Richmond and El Cerrito during World War II. The forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans during the war, most of whom were citizens, is not a proud chapter in our country's history. It is, however, an important story which illustrates how easily our civil and constitutional rights can be violated when driven by mass hysteria, propaganda, and racism. As many of you know, before I came to work at Rosie the Riveter six years ago, I was the superintendent at Mazinar National Historic Site on the east side of the Sierra, one of the lo locations where Japanese Americans were held during the war. While working at the site, I had the opportunity to learn in detail about the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans and the profound effects this mass removal had on the people and communities along the West Coast. When I arrived at Manzanar, I thought I had a pretty good idea of this history. From my first day there until now, I continued to learn new stories of how people were affected and how they dealt with this forced removal. Whether it was through answers on the so-called loyalty questionnaire, the construction of lavish gardens in the camps, the creation of profound works of art at some of the sites, or enlisting in the segregated military, the Japanese American community both resisted and coped with this gross mistreatment as they found ways to persevere as citizens of this country. However people managed through the war, there is one message that cannot be lost. We need to never forget that the forced removal and incarceration of our citizens without due process is wrong and should not be tolerated in our country. While I was still at Manzanar, I had the opportunity to speak with Lucy Lawless, who was our chief of cult the, ch the chief of cultural resources here in the park, and Donna Graves about the preservation efforts surrounding the Oishi and the Sakai nurseries in Richmond. Shortly after arriving here, I remembered discussions about how to help preserve some of the aspects of the nursery sites. The idea of developing a film came up, and we were approached to see if we'd be willing to show it in our visitor center. The Japanese American community, led by the Contra Costa Japanese American Citizen League, in particular Shizu Iyama and Don Del Colo, believed that the reason for the exclusion of Japanese Americans from World War II industries and the efforts that would be recounted at the new park needed to be part of the story being told. At the time, both the visitor center and the film were just ideas, and we were happy to accommodate, but were unsure what the visitor center would look like, let alone the film. Fast forward, and here we are today. Our visitor center has been open for nearly two years, and almost that entire time, we've been showing this film. We have a weekly scheduled screening with Flora Nina Mia, who provides context on the opportunity and an opportunity to have a dialogue about these experiences. In my mind, this project is a model for what makes this park so powerful and unique. As the park has developed, it has become clear that there is so much we don't know about the history. Thankfully, we have the opportunity to work with a variety of communities in Richmond and beyond to help explore and share their diverse histories. Taking ownership of this history and being involved in how it is portrayed to the public is important. Therefore, we applaud the Contra Costa Japanese American Citizens League, the Blossoms and Thorns Film Committee, the film's director Ken Koka, and advisor Donna Graves for making this film happen, and we are honored to be working with you to help tell these stories as part of the greater Homefront experience. And Ken's here, but if, if there's anybody from the if there's anybody from the film um, committee that's here, if you could join us up here. And I think, come on up. 
the film committee in particular and, and Flora in particular, who's with us every week. Thank, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II. I was going to UC Berkeley and at the time, and uh, suddenly uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and we were at war. And before we knew it, we, all the Japanese Americans were put into camp, and we were behind barbed wire fences, and we had American uniformed people around the, around the camp with their guns pointed at us. I mean, it was a terrible feeling as an American to be put into a jail, which was really a concentration camp. And so this uh, experience has really affected us in looking at civil rights, that this is a very important aspect. And so what we learned from this is that all of us have to be very careful to make sure that civil rights of all the people in our country are protected. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to put together a film. And it's basically the story of the Japanese people who are into the flower industry and made it really grow. I think someone told me that before World War II, whenever there was a senior prom, almost all the people had corsages that were put together by the Japanese American florists. So this has been a very important part of our uh, life in terms of uh, having a real foothold in American uh, life, in American cities. And so thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. We put this uh, video together basically to tell the story of the Japanese American who worked in and developed the floral industry here in this area. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, chime in that, uh, first of all, I'm very uh, disappointed actually that Donna Graves is not here. She was a, an integral part of this process. And uh, I really don't know that the project would have turned out the way it did without Donna's involvement. Um, another person who I wish was here um, is Tom Oishi. For those of you who have seen the project, uh, it's interesting because uh, for me, the, my name is on, on it as a film by, but it's really a film by a group of people, uh, an organization. We did it together. And uh, we knew the basic outlines of what we were going to say. We knew the, the general intent that we wanted to convey in terms of civil rights, in terms of the history, uh, in terms of the, the relevance of that event to 
life today. But honestly, it wasn't for me, it wasn't until I talked to Tom Oishi and he was very frank about his experience. He was in his early 20s, he was working as a welder at the, at the Kaiser Shipyards when his parents were told, you gotta leave Richmond because it's, it, it's, it's, you're not allowed to be here. And they went to Berkeley. I, I mean, they didn't go very far. And he asked his foreman, who was an Italian, uh, an Italian foreman, he said, should I be working here? And he's like, you, go, you grow up in Richmond? Yeah. You, know, you, you, you pay tax in Richmond? Yeah. He's like, oh, you can be here. So he didn't think that anything could really happen to him. He really felt like he was untouchable as an American citizen. And then he got shipped away. He was American and he got shipped away. And his expression of the anger that he felt was in a certain way what I had been waiting to hear. Um, and because Japanese Americans uh, have had to suppress a lot of things, I think, because of what's happened. And it's only now, I think, in the last 30, 40 years where people have started to feel like it's okay and their kids have said, no, wait a second, that was wrong. You gotta say something. And so to hear Tom express that and to see these pictures of this really vibrant, healthy man who had been put in jail and how that impacted him for the rest of his life was something that was really meaningful to me. And to me, it provided the, the, the spine of the story. And Tom died last year. Um, but he used to laugh and say that, that we were like his agents making him famous because <laughs> he would get a chance to go out there and tell his story. And, and I thought that that was really important because growing up I had, I had relatives who said we should get over internment, we shouldn't talk about internment, it's in the past. And we gotta let that go and move forward. And there's a certain relevance to that. I do kind of agree with that and now I totally disagree with it <laughs> in so much as I see telling the story has a relevance to today and to the future that shouldn't be lost. And so we're very happy, uh, the video committee, uh, the Contra Costa JACL, uh, everyone who participated in making the film, we're very happy that it's getting out, it's getting an audience, and that especially for, for uh, like high school, junior high school age, they're finding that it, it is a good way to create discussion. And uh, I'm also especially indebted to Flora for, for uh, being a docent for, for the talks at Rosie the Riveter every week because I think that is a really important aspect of it as well. So thank you very much. Have you noticed that there's a theme seems to be going on, a theme of collaboration? Not one of these awards was um, earned by any one entity. Um, it's, it's a combination, and, and I, to me this makes it extra exciting. And let's continue the trend, because the next award is also a collaboration uh, between Richmond Rotary and the East Bay Center for the Performing Arts. And to present the award, we have Joanne Pavlinik. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be the presenter on this award to the Richmond Rotary Club and the East Bay Center for the Performing Arts for producing the play, Lost Secrets of the Iron Triangle. First, a little background on the production. The play was based on the book, Richmond Tales, Lost Secrets of the Iron Triangle by Summer Brenner. And the play's storyline generally followed the book. The time is about 1980. And the play revolves around a young Maisha Yates, the heroine, who finds the name of her neighborhood, the Iron Triangle, to be a mystery that no one can explain. Maisha and her, neighbor, uh, her new neighbor, young Mario Reyes, travel back through time in Richmond. First, they encounter a Native American Ohlone girl. Then they have an adventure with rough and tumble entrepreneurs of the early industrial 20th century. Next, they move on to the World War II shipyards to experience the unprecedented change in Richmond. They visit the vibrant jazz and blues nightclub scenes of North Richmond. Finally, they get a glimpse 
of the possible of Richmond's future. The future they see is based on positive change that a motivated and determined generation can achieve. So that's the story. Yes, the play is about history in Richmond, but the award is to two local organizations who partnered to produce the play last year. So besides Richmond and history, what else does this award have to do with historic preservation? There are three things I want to address that the play accomplishes for historic preservation. The first is a greater public understanding of history. The second is community outreach and education. And the final, as it, which is the theme of tonight, is non-traditional partnerships. Most often when we think of historic preservation, buildings, structures, historic neighborhoods come to mind. And it's true uh, that the overarching goal of preservation is to protect these resources. But recently, there's been a movement to more broadly define historic preservation. California's most recent statewide historic preservation plan takes an all-inclusive view with the goal to achieve a common vision for historic preservation in California. Here is a quote from the executive summary. Historical and cultural resources will serve as a source of shared pride valued by all community members. But how do we get to shared pride valued by all community members? Well, the first is accomplishment of the play, and that's public understanding. We need to help the public understand and come to care about cultural resources in our communities. The play offered knowledge, understanding, and appreciation of the city's past. It fostered civic pride in the beauty and personality of the city and in the accomplishments of its past. The play repackaged history in a way that both young and adults can appreciate. We especially need to reach out to our young people. We need to think about what concerns young people and then engage them in a way that motivates them to a longer term involvement in historic preservation. A dramatic product, a play, is the perfect vehicle for that. As a dramatic product, the play emotionally reached the young audience and the actors. And as a dramatic product, the play emotionally reconnected the oldest members of the audience with memories of a past Richmond they had almost forgotten. The second accomplishment is community outreach and education. And uh, community outreach and education is cited in the state plan as a historic preservation issue we need to work on. The play was an outstanding instance of community outreach and education. There were six performances, 725 ticketed audience members, 35 staff and technicians from the East Bay Center for Performing Arts worked on the production. 10 Rotarians a night staffed the ticket booth and ushered. Richmond Rotary also participated in community events to promote the play. Uh, and it reached many, and it raised public awareness. The third is non-traditional partnerships. Just a few weeks ago at the California Preservation Con Foundation Conference, the focus of the conference was redefining historic preservation. And there was a lot of talk about becoming more inclusive. One of the workshop tracks was building partnerships, partnerships outside of historic preservation. This production was a partnership between two organizations, Richmond Rotary and the East Bay Center for the Performing Arts. And while both of these organizations have a history in Richmond, historic preservation is probably not the first thing that comes to mind when we hear of either organization. Uh, this award acknowledges their contribution and a fortuitous non-traditional partnership with, with the historic preser preservation community. Overall, the play was a tremendous effort um, and included fundraising, scripting, casting, rehearsals, costuming, props, scenery, staging, publicity, ushering, and on and on. Chris Treadway of the Contra Costa Times wrote about the play. He quoted Jim Young, who was then the Rotary president at the time of the production. And Jim says, to the best of my knowledge, no one else in Rotary has been crazy enough to take on such, such a venture. So on behalf of Richmond's Historic Preservation Commission, thank you to both Richmond Rotary and to the East Bay Center for Performing Arts, both for being crazy enough to take on this venture and making it a success for historic preservation. 
Uh, to accept the award, we have the current Rotary President, Lillian Cozio, and the past president, Jim Young, who was president at the time of the production, Jordan Simmons, the executive director of the East Bay Center for Performing Arts, and I think we have a whole cast of actors here. As we are celebrating uh, historic preservation today, uh, I would like to say that I would like to add a couple more elements that we have not mentioned yet regarding uh, the meaning of historic preservation and the unlikely collaboration between the Richmond uh, Rotary Club and the uh, uh, East Bay Center. Um, and we have the youth here, so I think something, two new elements I would like to add that has not, have not been mentioned yet is uh, definitely the uh, uh, giving the youth and the young people uh, pride in their identity, looking at the past in order to look uh, towards the future. And uh, the second thing is that I think that through the play, the intent was also to boost the self-esteem of, of the wonderful um, uh, youth group that, uh, to whom the play was intended for, uh, the parents uh, who were present uh, in the play. So I think it was wonderful that um, under the leadership of Jim's presidency in 2012-2013, uh, the club was very happy to support this wonderful production. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim uh, to say additional few words. So. Congratulations to the club. And thank, you. thank you, President Lilly. And I, uh, I uh, actually don't have a prepared speech, so this isn't going to be very long. I, uh, I want to, uh, I do want to say a couple of things about Rotary and why we were crazy enough to do it. Um, and I'm delighted to hear that it is so much forward uh, in the concept of, of historical preservation, because frankly, uh, Richmond doesn't get enough credit for being on the forefront of a lot of things that it is. And um, somebody once said uh, there's a dearth of news about Richmond, but actually this is a dearth of good news about Richmond, and I'm delighted that this is part of it. Um, Rotary International is a big organization. There are 34,000 clubs worldwide with about 1.2 million members. Uh, they do a lot of things all over the world as part of service to their communities. Uh, in the context of looking at service and what's important, there are six uh, focuses that we are asked to take a look at. This particular play took on three of them, and within the pantheon of Rotary, when we went to ask for help doing it financially, which, by the way, we got, um, promoting peace, promoting literacy, and promoting economic development were all used by our district uh, leadership to justify their support for our club. And I want to acknowledge District 5160 of Rotary for what was the single largest grant supporting this very large, expensive project beyond the very radical generosity of Richmond Rotarians, some of whom are here tonight, some of whom actually participate in these other words. And I'd just like to have a, a round of applause for them right now. You can't know your history if you don't know what it is, and that's really what the big opportunity of doing the play was. Uh, I know when I grew up as a little kid, I thought the world was always just like it was when I walked out the street. And, and Richmond Tales, the book, does an outstanding job of bringing that point home uh, from the point of view of, of, of Richmond youth and the triangle. And it's wonderful to tell them about many, many things that they don't know about. But that couldn't have been done by Rotary. <laughs> we are not play producers. And so I was delighted to know, and I've known him for a long time, both in business uh, and as a neighbor, Jordan Simmons. And I want to ask Jordan to come up because, quite frankly, it wouldn't have happened without him. Maybe it wouldn't have happened without hi us, but Jordan, would you please come up here? <laughs> Say a few words. You all already already said it pretty well. Thanks, Joanne, for all the lining out the things. Um, it's very true. Uh, without Jim's craziness, 
saying, hey, produce, let's produce something about peace. And we have a, several plays. Uh, he picked this one. Uh, Summer did a great job uh, transforming her book into a script. We tried to stay pretty faithful to it. Um, so she gets the credit for the idea. Um, but Jim and Rotary, um, supported by uh, Tom Waller, David Brown, uh, Linda Young was volunteering at all the rehearsals, chasing uh, props and pieces. Uh, Rotary brought, there were roughly about 1,200 people who came and saw the play. I don't know how many were ticketed. I probably shouldn't mention that because you're going to come back and ask for some of that money. Um, you know, the real heroes of this piece, though, are young people who get involved uh, outside of uh, the normal box and who spend the, you know, the 120, 140 hours that it takes to sort of go through the rehearsal. Uh, when they're also supposed to be doing homework and taking care of chores and their kids and things and uh, their family. So really, um, you know, we, we know the history that we need to overcome in this town, in this country, uh, but it is a dialogue. It's a dialectic about what is possible uh, based on young people imagining something different. So I want to recognize, uh, and if you could just raise your hand, stand up as a recognized. We had about 16 young people in the cast. Uh, a few of them are here tonight that were really great. Um, who, Maisha, Shania Richardson. <laughs> uh, Annika Richardson, Devon Scott, Kevon Franklin, Edwin Guerra. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and really, the last word uh, for this work should really go to the young people. So I'm going to ask first uh, Vanessa to say a short word, and then uh, Troy. Uh, Richardson, uh, Vanessa uh, Lopez um, from just around the block of the center lives in the Iron Triangle. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. And I would like to say that I had a lot of fun during the play, and how I actually came across the play was actually funny because I, I was taking a theater class at the East Bay Center. And my teacher, he told me that they were going to be doing the play and if I wanted to do it. So I also sort of owe it to my mom because she's the one who told me to go. So, and, yeah, and so when, while I was waiting there, I, when I went to the, to the auditions, I was waiting for a week. I kept, whenever my mom picked me up from school, I would say, oh, have they called back yet? Oh, have they called back yet? So then when she finally told me that they had told that they had accepted me, I was very happy. And I actually I had to thank thank my theater teacher Mario Gonzalez, who isn't here today, um, a lot because then if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here. So. Um. I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and I appreciate the award that we all got. And I'm actually, I actually enjoy doing the play because I just got out of school. I was happy I can do whatever I want now. <laughs> but um, when I did the play, I actually learned a lot of things about Richmond that I actually never knew about. But during World War II and what happened to um, the Japanese people when World War II happened, so I actually enjoyed because I had many parts that. I actually never could understand. So I'm actually really proud to even be in this production and the play. And for all you guys coming out here to see see all of us tonight, because we all did a very great job at doing this play. And I like to thank all of them, even though I live with them. And I like to thank all of you, everybody out here who came out here today just to see us. So thank you. If I might conclude, there is one person I want to remember with this, because this is, is a time to remember our history. And uh, within our club, uh, the play has is, is created a lot of buzz. It's gone back and forth. But there was a member who can't participate anymore. He's uh, uh, too old and he's frail. But he's for decades and decades and decades, he's a major part of this community. Many of you bought your groceries at his store, Central Markets. Charlie Wong. I want you to know that he sends you his best and he feels absolutely honored to have spent his life in Richmond.
Tall people. What a treat to have the cast. And I had no idea that they were coming. Thank you all very much. So we all know about the Bay Trail. We know that uh, it's now a place we can go and you can walk, walk or ride your bike or, or lots of other things. But it's important to know that track is also preserving history. And to tell us all about it is Don Bastion. Uh, boy, it's going to be hard to top that last one. But <laughs> uh, This is the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Bay Trail Project, uh, founded in 1989 um, as a part of ABAG, uh, Association of Bay Area Governments. Um, and the mission of the project was to establish and create a trail, a 500 mile trail, a biking and hiking trail to completely surround uh, San Francisco and San Pablo Bays. Um, uh, it was envisioned to go through nine counties and 47 cities. Uh, in 1999, uh, Bruce ba Bayert, um, decided to create um, track Trails for Richmond Action Committee. The project uh, didn't specify basically how each section of the trail was going to be created. It was left to each city, uh, community on the trail. Some cities elected to um, do it themselves. Uh, in other cities, uh, individuals or groups got together to do that. And that's what happened in Richmond. Again, in 1999, Bruce Byert uh, created track. And the uh, steering committee uh, of the committee, and I've been a member of that committee since 2002. Uh, the uh, trail, um, <laughs> it was um, meant to be um, 500 miles, as I, I mentioned, but, uh, um, oh, I think I kind of went blank there. Um, should, should have had this written down. Uh, if for any of you who know Bruce, uh, he um, uh, is a person who is tremendously dedicated, uh, tremendously focused. I've never known anyone quite like him. He's a really nice guy, very mi mild-mannered guy, and I think most people who have worked with him in the city or other groups uh, think he's kind of a pushover at first. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they soon learn the error of their ways uh, he's absolutely dedicated to the uh, proposition of creating this Bay Trail in Richmond, and as a result of his efforts, uh, uh, 32 miles of Bay Trail have been completed in Richmond, 10 miles remain, but that's due to his effort, and that's more than any other city on the Bay Trail. Uh, as I say, you don't, you, he doesn't go away. Uh, you may think you can put him aside for for a while, but uh, he keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And as a result, not only has uh, Richmond created 32 miles of Bay Trail, but they are probably the best 
part of the Bay Trail that had been created. Um, he is absolutely dedicated to uh, making certain that um, this Bay Trail is the best trail in, in the system. Uh, nothing second best for Bruce. Um, unfortunately, Bruce isn't here. Uh, he's on his way back from a trip to Greece, but uh, it, to accept the award for Bruce is another Bruce, uh, Bruce Brubaker, who is also a member of the uh, uh, Bay Trail uh, subcommittee, the uh, steering committee, and I'd like to turn it over to Bruce. So thank you, Donald. Uh, yeah, Bruce, accepting the award for Bruce, it's appropriate. Um, I just wanted to say that the subcommittee members now are uh, Bruce Byert, uh, Nancy Strzok, Whitney Dodson, Jerry Rasmussen, myself, and Donald Bastin. So we have our mole here at the Historic <laughs> Committee. And I do want to give props to Donald because this is a historic award. And a lot of what we do on the, well, the main goal of the Bay Trail is connecting it. And we've done a pretty good job, 32 out of 39 miles so far, and we're still working on it. but. You know, there's additional stuff that we do that is making it interesting for people to visit the Bay Trail. And a big part of that is Donald Bastin because he's the head of the interpretive wing of track where we're uh, installing signs that tell you what the wildlife is and tell you very often what the historic elements are that you're passing by. So that's been a big part of the Bay Trail and particularly the historic part, Donald's been great. So. Props to Donald. It, it also, I want to say that it helps to have a director of the East Bay Regional Park District on our subcommittee, and that's Whitney Dodson, and he's not here tonight, but uh, it's, the, the committee is pretty powerful, and I think we've gotten a lot done, and it's a pleasure. And lastly, I want to say this is a very inspiring event tonight. This has been really interesting and good to attend, so thank you all very much. I have four more things to say and then I'm through. Some of you don't believe that. The first one is I would like to introduce Hector Rojas. Hector. <laughs> Hector is staff to our commission and he's a very talented graphic artist. He does the invitation, he does the program, he does the uh, PowerPoint. Um, I, we wouldn't begin to be so Im so good looking without him. <laughs> the second thing is, would all the honorees stay for a couple minutes, maybe over in that, here. Ellen says, here. Because we try very hard every year to get a picture of everybody. So please, just the honorees stay. The third thing is, there's a reception at the Art Center. The Richmond Art Center, you just go out there and run across the plaza, and uh, the college, culinary department, Contra Costa College, has brought food, and there's wine, and thanks to Joanne, there's music. So please come and celebrate with us for a little while. And the fourth thing is, thank you very much for coming. And the next thing is Sandy Genzer Mack puts this together every year and does a wonderful job. Thank you. She thanks everybody else and she does all the work. So thank you. 